So welcome everyone to a webinar on GraphQL optimization. I'm Bobby Cochran. I'm joined by my colleague, Dan DeBruner, and we are both from Steps In, and we work on the backend GraphQL engine. Um, a little bit about ourselves. We spent our careers working on the database internals of many of uh, the major databases out there. Dan was the lead architect for Apache Derby, uh, which is an open source Java database. And he was also the lead architect for IBM Streams. And before that, he was the performance architect for some databases you may or may not have heard of, Sybase, Celestra, and Informix that were eventually acquired by IBM. Um, I spent my uh, early days in database semantics, um, and I entered the scene when we were pouring the foundation for the workstation, workstation edition for DB2 at IBM, and it was done uh, out of the IBM Almaden Research Center. Um, at that time, I was fortunate enough to be working with Triggers and Constraints, and I uh, was the author of the SQL Triggers and Constraints model and contributed to many other aspects of the early standards, including XML and JSON in databases. So with all that past history behind us, we are both now working at Steps In on GraphQL engine and uh, very excited about the opportunities for optimizing the GraphQL. So what we're going to basic our outline, we're going to give you some background on GraphQL optimization, why we're interested in it, uh, what are the opportunities for optimization right now, some techniques, and, and then we'll conclude. And we'll give you some sidebar uh, analogies to the relational database evolution and optimization techniques that we worked in. So GraphQL is a query language for your API, and this comes from the graphql.org um, description. And the main thing that we're really excited about is it gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. And so it's this declarative way of specifying what you want, what you need, and nothing more. And it's in contrast, uh, what, what we really uh, find fascinating is that back in the 1970s, um, there was this landmark article by uh, Ted Codd, who basically was studying uh, the data access layer at the time and saying that the future large data banks have to be protected from knowing how the data is organized. So the whole idea there was building that independence um, of the data of the application from the data layer. So to allow future growth in data types and changes in data representation. So you can sort of see where history is repeating itself itself, but now we're pulling it up to the modern frameworks that we're all working in. Thanks, Bobby, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is, you know, a view of GraphQL, and especially a step sense view of GraphQL, that you are bringing all your data together into that single API that allows you to do what Bobby just said about the clients being able to ask for the data they need and nothing more. And one of the things one of the things we'll get into is especially they don't care where the data comes from, how it's organized. They just want, according to the GraphQL schema, to say, I need this customer, this author, and this list of books, and that's all I need. And so we see data at the back end coming from SQL databases, non-SQL or no-SQL databases, existing applications, SAS apps, REST and microservices, and even other GraphQL backends. So you'll get into this. Know, nesting of subgraphs, supergraphs, other subgraphs that pull in all the data that that application needs and no more. Now, when we look at GraphQL and you sort of start out the, at the tutorials, you'll see queries very similar to these. You know, I picked these three from random tutorials I found everywhere, including one steps in one. Um, and when you look at these, you might think, well, there's not much opportunity to optimize any of these queries. You know, the first one up there, students, it's probably going to some single backend, maybe a Postgres database, and just doing a simple you know, select star from students and bringing in the ID and the name. But, you know, as in all systems, that the power comes when you really expand the capabilities and and clients, customers, et cetera, start to take advantage of the full power of GraphQL and start with or start writing much more complex graphs. 
And and Dan, this reminds me of in our sequel days, you know, the, the introductory sequel queries were, you know, very elegant and somewhat non-interesting. But when you actually got into solving real world problems and implementing the full semantics, the true power became when when it's this large scale usage and then those requests become not so simple which is a, a you know a great opportunity to be able to allow the user still to specify what they want but let the engine do that automation of optimizing and figuring out okay i see you're pulling together these two things i mean the the famous one was the easy easy way in sql to write a query which has a subquery in it um, because you're getting a nested list of things. You're, you have your authors and your orders or your authors and your books. And so you would you know, query the authors and then you would go inside a, a, a nested subquery. But that's not a very optimal way always to allow the optimizer to figure out how to best res respond to that. So we would do what was called a subquery to join transformation. So this is where it becomes very interesting is when you still allow the user to specify what they want in the way that they like to think about it, but you turn around and we can actually, in the engines, autom automatically optimize that. Thanks, Bobby. Now, you know, once you've started with GraphQL and you've probably done a little research and you've moved beyond the simple queries, you'll start seeing things about the N plus one problem. And this is related to, if you write your GraphQL server or the GraphQL server is written naively, when the client comes in and asks for something like authors and all the books written by those authors, the, that's a single request for the client, but the GraphQL server will issue one request to get the list of authors or, or single author. And then it'll issue a number of requests to get the, the books for all the authors, et cetera. And so you did, or the GraphQL server did one request and then an N further request to get the further information in that tree. Um, and that's seen as a problem because you start to spam, spam the back end, right? Okay, could you have done that in fewer requests to the back end? And especially with GraphQL, as we'll see, as you get a, a, a deeper query, you can get an explosion of how many queries go to the back end. Yeah, and and again, this is a this is a typical performance anti-pattern introduced when the object relational models were introduced to help programmers access the, the database. The ORMs actually encouraged a behavior that would spam the database. But of course, those problems were solved eventually by recognizing the full uh, scope of what was going to be um, requested. So um, by the way, I forgot to say something up front. Please say hi in the chat box so uh, we can we can all say hi to you. Okay, Dan, back to you. Thanks, Bobby. So how do we get more complexity in a, in a GraphQL query? So you know, GraphQL is all about selecting fields. And when you select a top level field, it's typically has an object that you then select subfields on and those can have objects, et cetera, et cetera. So if you see here, we've got authors, it's going to books, but then we've got similar authors is another field and that's returning authors. So again, we can go to the name of the authors and then their books, et cetera. And hopefully this will jump out at you saying, okay, now we can start to see opportunity, opportunities for optimization because I was going to an author's subsystem, a subgraph, a backend database at the first level. And now at subsequent levels, I'm doing a similar pattern. I'm going and getting other, um, authors and other books from the from the same system so now can i start to combine requests reuse requests etc then a, another part of graphql is you have arbitrary width so you know most queries you see in graphql written at tutorials etc start with a single top level field you know authors books title but any GraphQL operation can have any number of top level fields. So in the one above the dotted line here, we've got author is a top level field where we're getting the author's name, but we're also issuing a, an independent query within that same GraphQL request that's getting uh, a book and its title. And, you know, presume, uh, in case you didn't know, you can also repeat the same 
field, like author here, but with different aliases, so you can get different values. So now below the line, you can see that in a single request, we're calling the author field twice, but with different arguments and using aliases to allow us in the syntax of the language to do that. And, you know, so you can have any number of these fields. And what we see is that because at the GraphQL, you know, the very first slide or one of the first slides that Bobby showed is it's about the clients requesting the data that they want and no more is that they may for a, to complete a full web page for example they may issue 20 top level fields with queries that fill out independent parts of that page because they're all generated from independent you know uh, react components so the the pop-up window may have its own little you know sub query if you like in that graphql that top level field the footer you know, that may be a rolling bar of, in, in our books example, that we keep talking about, maybe a, a rolling list of upcoming talks by uh, author signings, that may be another query. And so when you put this all together in my really bad diagram, what you see is this is meant to represent a complete request um, that may be fulfilling something like a web page, as I said. And on the left are the top level fields that are being selected and each circle represents a field. And we can see that to the right, it could be arbitrary deep. So, you know, authors, books, titles, related authors, etc., And then down maybe those independent components for independent parts of the, of the page. And then each of these fields may be that GraphQL server may be calling out to different backends to actually resolve that information, to get to gather that information. And what we typically see are, you know, REST APIs, databases, SQL or NoSQL, GraphQL servers. And this picture is just meant to show that that simple or single request that's coming from the client may be being populated from a whole disparate number of backend systems. And I'm not just saying that there are you know, three backend systems here. I'm saying there are three types of backend systems that you might typically come across. And that, you know, there may be three database systems, two REST APIs, and one or two GraphQL APIs. And because of the way GraphQL works, you know, these are meant to represent the field selections or the nodes and the plan that is created from that field selection. That, um, uh, you know, one of those or many of those may be returning lists of objects. And so you get this explosion of objects as you go deeper into the tree to the right. So that uh, pop-up arrow here, where it says potential for hundreds of calls to that API, that means that, you know, there were lists of lists of lists before, and maybe we're going to return a hundred objects at that point, which requires a hundred call outs to that REST API. So you can obviously see now how we start to uh, spam backends and um, you may think this is maybe unlikely, but you know, within steps then we saw that one of our, our users who started out very quickly, I was looking at one of their requests today and they had, the request was um, almost 5K long. So it wasn't one of those you know, simple 20 character ones. It had three or four fragments in there, which allow you to sort of repeat code efficiently. And those fragments were nested within it. So even if you looked at that query you know, manually, it was really hard to figure out how deep that tree was. And it was probably you know, eight or nine levels deep. And it, again, it was gathering all the information for a simple, for a single web page that they wanted to display. And now we start to see, as we, from our database sort of background, we start to see where the opportunities for optimization are. So. You know, at the bottom, we've got the same API calls. So those red circles, maybe those are the same API calls. So how can I do optimizations across them so that I do the least amount of work to that backend? So instead of maybe sending you know 200 requests to that backend, I can send 20 or maybe even optimally one. And, and then similarly with DB, with databases, right? So can I combine those database requests because it's you know, database has SQL, which is a very powerful language. As Bobby was saying, I can combine multiple queries into a single query with subqueries and joins and everything to get the data I need. 
Um, so Dan, I'm going to interrupt you. This is also for everybody to know. But so you just described how we can go arbitrary deep and arbitrarily wide, which are optimizations to reduce the width and the depth. And yet we look at this and we keep harping back to our SQL backgrounds, but a SQL engine doesn't handle this kind of hierarchical traversal and optimization. So while we can you, we can infer from our backgrounds what our opportunities are, we can't just hand this over to a SQL engine, can we? That's right, because it, it, it's very different. If you look at the GraphQL model, these, you know, I'm showing four top level fields in the, in the request that's coming in. In the GraphQL model, those are all executed independently. So any typical GraphQL server will spawn threads, go routines, whatever, to set them off. So now there's four independent flows, which doesn't really happen from the SQL model because it's a single query. You know, there may be parallelism under the covers, but it's a single entity, whereas here we've got N separate entities. And so there is additional opportunity here to say, okay, can we not just look in within for optimization opportunities within that single tree, that single plan, if you like, of nodes that a SQL engine might do, but can we look across all of these four independent plans to see if there are opportunities. And then also, you know, it's a hierarchical model. It's not a relational model. So what differences come in there? Thanks, Bobby. So um, we're going to take you through, now we've given you ideas of opportunities, but we're now going to take you through uh, several techniques. Um, and the primary focus that we've been looking at is reducing the number of backend calls. So reducing the spamming of those backends and, and really being able to get what has been asked for in the context of the entire, uh, in, in the entire GraphQL request, getting what's been asked for, but being able to reduce the number of backend calls. So the several techniques are deduplication, reuse, caching, and prefetching of fields. All of this can be done independent of what the back end does or does not do. So we can do that all within our own engine. With batching and combining, those do require that we have some support from the back ends, and we'll get into those details when we get there. Right. And as we describe these techniques, we're mostly going to describe them standalone. So typically, a GraphQL server will be using them within combination of each other, but then it just gets way too confusing to uh, to describe them. So and this again was done, you know, to bring back our SQL experience. The query rewrite engines did this. They actually, even the way they implemented it, they re they implemented the rules, and then they were able to combine rules uh, with a rule based engine. So this is sort of you know historical standard based practice to look at these independently, but then combine them in a heuristic way. So deduplication, as it say, it's removing du duplicate requests to the back end. And the first example here is, is very simple, if you like. So we've got, we're requesting three authors, but two of them have the same ID. So instead of sending three, firing off those in requests independently and sending you know, three requests to that back end, can we instead uh, detect that and just send two of those requests off. And obviously, you know, some of the reasons for doing this are it reduces, you know, optimizes the client side, but also reduces number of requests to the back end, offloading that back end, but potentially saving you money as well, because instead of being charged, you know, however much per call, you're only being charged for two calls instead of three calls. Now, you know, this is a very simple example and you may think well no one would ever do that but again going back to the query is generated potentially generated right if you were handwriting this you'd never do this but if the query is generated again the the, the client is asking for the data they need in the shape that they need which is another big part of graphql so if again this, these were for different parts of a web page for different pop-ups in the web page maybe they do show the same author in different guises. So it, it's not that this will never happen. It, it, it may happen and frequently does. A more, maybe a more common case is the one below the dotted line, where if we have a 
GraphQL system that searches for books, given the topic, so it returns a list of 100 cookbooks, you can imagine that there's not going to be 100 unique authors. So as we get the information per the author, there may be 20 unique authors. So when we go to the author's backend system, can we issue 20 requests, deduplicating from 100, and, and again, you know, reduce load on the back end? Now, a key part of this is, okay, you've reduced the request, but you still have to map those results you get back from the back end into the correct places in the GraphQL response, you know, the, the data that the client is actually seeing. Because it asks for the requests laid out in the way that GraphQL does, so it does want to see the author repeated, you know, those 20 authors repeated across those 100 book entries. Um, Reuse, now you may think this is, is similar to deduplication, um, but with deduplication, it's sort of upfront, you manage to know that, hey, I can see these identifiers or these requests are gonna be the same, so I'm gonna deduplicate them. Reuse is saying at some point in the tree, hey, I see that I've already executed this request or this subgraph before, so I can reuse the operations from a, typically an earlier part in the tree. So in this case, we're looking for authors um, uh, with name of Huxley and authors with name of Orwell, but we're also at the top there getting, you know, similar authors to these two authors. And you can imagine that Orwell is a similar author to Huxley and, and vice versa. So when I come to execute the getting the author's information for a similar author, a similar author to Huxley, which is Orwell, can I see that I've already fetched George Orwell's information? So let's reuse that and just use the internal data I've already gathered rather than going to the back end and saying, give me Orwell again, and vice versa. Um, that's that one. Bobby? Yeah, so with, with caching, it's a you know well-known technique. Um, and the idea, this is a cross request. We're going to keep local queries or local copies of the results to a common request. And of course, you know, just, just like with any caching, it's going to reduce the load on the back end. It reduces the latency on the front end. And it span, it's, again, spans request, which is how we differentiate that from reuse. Um, and um, there are you know, the opportunities are with back and request um, with the GraphQL fields and also with the GraphQL operation in, across the entire set. The considerations are cache and validation and cache and fiction, you know, again, standard practice, but these are the kinds of things that we can now do within our GraphQL engine. And then this one is about prefetching fields. If you can see what's coming, you can see the entire uh, you might get a request, one request for author that's only getting the name and birthplace. And then the next re request may ask for, uh, you know, name and email. We can look at that together. And in a single request to the back end, we can get all of the information that's needed for all of the requested queries. So the GraphQL gives us the visibility into what's coming. And, and again, this prefetching is, is, is something that's well known as well. Right. And, and so this is an example where it would tie into reuse, right? So if you if your top of the tree was getting George Orwell information, but you notice further down the tree, you might need additional information for authors. You know, why not fetch it there once rather than having to do that subsequent fetch? So it enables or it's, it allows you, gives you more opportunities to, to uh, do reuse if you prefetch the fields. So batching, and this is where we start to rely on the back end to provide some functionality. You know, as the, what we said, the previous uh, three or four techniques, we could all do independent of the back end. Here we're saying that, okay, we, we've, the user has made a request to get information on three authors. Uh, you know, using a REST API, I could send out, um, 
three independent requests and get the information back and fulfill the user, and that would be great. But is there a possibility that I could send one request to the to the backend system, whether it's REST or database, and get all of the uh, information in one request, thus improving my response time? And you know, there are standard techniques to do this. SQL, you know, a way of doing it is to to have an in list here. So I do instead of having three independent selects with a, just a where name equals something, I can change it to a where name is in the list of items that I want to retrieve. Um, for GraphQL, if, the, if it's a backend GraphQL system now that I'm, I'm federating, I can just create a more complex GraphQL query that has the, the same field of the same you know, tree selected, but just do them as different top level fields using aliases and pull them back using that single request. And you know, for REST, there are various techniques. You know, a really simple one is we would just re uh, um, repeat. That's the word. Repeat the uh, query parameter name using the, the standard ampersand name equals Huxley, etc. Um, now, in, in some cases, you'll see this called data loading as well. Um, especially if you're trying to do this across that entire graph that we showed out, the, the entire request or the, the colored uh, circles, you may have timing there. So you just do some simple timing to say, I'm going to gather a batch. And if I haven't had anything added to the batch after a millisecond, I'll go and send off all those requests with the risk that some later request will come in from another part of the, the uh, selection tree that you could have batched with, but you missed. So you know, you'll still improve it instead of sending out maybe 10 requests to a back end, you'll send out two two requests, you know, one with eight batch, one with eight items and the other one with two items. However, going one step further is to say if you've got that complete visibility of the graph and you can do enough dependency checking, you can actually figure out when a batch can no longer have any additional items pushed to it. And in that case, you can just kick the batch off at that point. And that means that you always have the minimal delay um, to fulfill that information. So instead of waiting for five milliseconds or milliseconds, you may be after 100 microseconds to say, hey, I know this batch is as complete as it can never be. Let's send it off. Uh, Bobby, do you want to take this one? Um, yeah, so this is where we're going to combine requests from a different level into one request. And so um, in this case, um, we'll take, um, you get the author and you're asking for us to get the, um, I'm so, sorry, I'm, I'm okay. humbling yeah, here. So basically we're, we're, we're requesting author at the top, the query is sort of hidden in the right, just to the left of that steps end gives us box. Um, so we're requesting author, and then we're requesting you know the books for that author. So we so typically we do a if we, this was a back-end database, we do a select name ID from authors where ID equals our requested ID. That gives us the author information. And then we'd issue a subsequent select to get the books information that obviously will return you know one or hopefully one or more books for that author but with a sql system and again if we have visibility in, into how these fields are being resolved um we can say oh I, I know authors and books are both the same back-end database and i know they're both sql systems so i can now combine that into a um into a simple join and get all the information I need in, in one request to that back end. And so instead of having, you know, again, this is an instance of the n plus one problem, instead of having one plus n, or I guess this is two requests, two requests to the database, I've got a single request to the database, and the database will handle it efficiency as we know. Um, as with many of these techniques, you know, it's somewhat simple to get the to reduce the number of requests by combining, reuse, et cetera. 
But again, the GraphQL engine then has to unpack all that data and make sure it gets placed in the correct location in the response that the user is expecting, the client is expecting. Because again, they said, this is the data I need in the shape I need. I don't want a, an abbreviated version of it. I need the data laid out exactly like this. And so, you know, we, we couldn't just give a relational, something that looked like a relational table coming back from this join, you know, a, a flattened version of it. We have to unpack that into the hierarchical uh, response that the, the GraphQL is, is, uh, is expecting, the GraphQL client is expecting. And, you know, part of it that we'll talk about later is that, you know, in steps and we see how to do these optimizations because everything is declarative. We, we said that author is coming from a database using our at DB query. The books was coming from a database using our at DB, DB query directive. And then from that metadata, that gives us the visibility to say, hey, we can combine these two into a single SQL statement. So as we've shown you, GraphQL promises the speed of development where clients are asking exactly what they need and nothing more. And there's many, many opportunities for optimization. And, um, you know, given our history and given the history of the way things evolve, we are really excited about this space because GraphQL and its optimizations will evolve over time as, as, as this technology grows. So we're very excited about this space. So we just a uh, little bit about us, you know, you can, we've told you about ourselves, but a little bit more about our whole team, you know, optimization is in our DNA. This is what we've done for our careers. And we're very excited to be uh, working in this space and, and applying it. So, so Dan, you want to take this one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so this is our, our shameless plug for Stepsen. Um, so Stepsen is all about assembling your graph GraphQL declaratively. And we have a number of uh, custom directives that, that, that basically allow you to do that. So, and that gives us the visibility to perform these kinds of optimizations. So at DB query, says this data information is coming from the database. And we can either, it's simple and you just say it's coming from database users or authors, or you can provide the uh, complete SQL query there or update, et cetera. And that allows you to have the full power of SQL um, or a simple case, you know, whatever works for you. At rest is a very quick way to bring um, rest backends, you know, HTTP backends, APIs, into your GraphQL system. At GraphQL brings other GraphQL systems into, uh, into your running GraphQL system. And that materializer is our glue that allows you to sort of link across types that allows you to bring authors in, sorry, books into authors, or authors having an address to bring the weather into the, into the uh, author's address so that you can see what uh, what's the weather at, at that author's location or that bookstore's location, et cetera. And we can run all of this, or we run all of this in, in the cloud. So with a few lines of code, you can start running your uh, GraphQL system connecting to existing backends very simply. You know, in, in addition, we have client-side tooling that, that generates most of the, the SDL, the structured language that describe the types like authors, books, et cetera, automatically so you can say steps in import postgres just to, to bring in a postgres schema create all the types and the queries automatically you know step zen import curl which goes and does a curl request against the back end again introspects the json produces the types and a similar thing for at graphql uh, and again that the declarative approach is key to us being able to perform optimizations here say hey we understand what's going on that this this uh, field over here is is a db query but it's going into a rest so i can't combine them or i can combine them rather than having sort of black box resolvers where the graphql engine can't do much apart from call them and that sort of brings in a i just was looking through some of the questions from 
was one from Mark um, that says these techniques is very hierarchical, correct? Execute the first layer of the fields, then dedupe, reuse. So that's true to some extent, but if I went back to the other graph, uh, our potential here is to actually try and optimize across levels, especially if you know some levels are getting ahead of each other, so that if if I have picked up authors from let's say the, the third depth level, uh, but it's being used in the fifth level, okay, I can reuse it there. But can I, before I even start executing the levels or, or layers, levels, whatever, um, can I detect that, oh, it would be better to organize it so that I actually wait to execute this flow until this other part is being executed because I can see that I'm going to get 90% reuse from a, a another part of the graph. So as uh, Bobby said, that we see lots of potential for optimization here. And, and as we learn more with GraphQL and what people are doing with GraphQL and the way the databases optimization evolved, the more and more techniques will come into play. So I, I see there were lots of comments. So I didn't have a chance to, to, to look at them, but I see Anant was looking after you. Um, yes, and apparently if you go to try to find the comments, you can knock yourself out of the meeting too. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, watching us today, wherever, whether you're watching it live or watching it on replay. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask them now. Bobby, do you see any questions or any uh, final thoughts? I'm I'm looking for the questions now too. I was just. Uh... Oh, thank you, Melanie. Yeah, I see. Uh, Venkada said that materializer, which is one of our directives that allows you to, it allows you to say that, that this field is populated by running this query over here. So your, uh, your, for example, your books, you, you might add a field to author that is books and say, okay, this is materialized by, it is populated by um, this query, get books by author ID. And so our model, is, instead of handwriting of a resolver there, our model is say, everything becomes a query, and then you link things throughout material, materializer. Um, and that's a, a database term, which probably may, may be confusing to people, right? We can't take the database out of us, even though we're working GraphQL now. Um, but yeah, any ways you can think of that would make app materializer be less imitating, in, intimidating would be uh, helpful to us, but we try to make it as simple as possible. And, and that model of everything is a query. And that also has the advantage that you can run those queries independently just by providing the right arguments, which you don't necessarily have if it was just hidden in a resolver because you'd have to create the, the fields above it, you know, the, the, the path to get there to actually run that, invoke that piece of code. So Mark Garrett said batching, looking to have that per layer across layers too. Yes, we uh, it would be across layers as well. So that if if um, like I say, these cases where you again that the that that quote that was sort of the theme throughout this whole talk of the client developer asks for what they want and nothing more. Nothing implies that that it's the minimal request needed. Right? That's why you will get duplicates. So that if there's a fairly simple query to get author for some pop-up that says, hey, this is your favorite author, but elsewhere there's a list of book signings that also has authors that may be you know, three, three or four levels deep in the tree, we would want to batch across those two, layer, uh, those two levels, right? To say, okay, if both of these are going to authors, then we should batch them and um, and again, your uh, prefetching fields comes in there as well. So we may get extra fields for, for one case to make sure that it satisfies the other. Let's 
So the question does steps and view GraphQL more as a data layer or as an oh. <laughs> you read one of these and then someone writes a comment and it jumps around. Um, right. So an aunt is answering that one. Or come and mark answering that one. So how to count. Sorry, Did you get that one? How to execute count? Yeah, so GraphQL by itself doesn't have any aggregation layer. And sometimes, you know, so um, you could definitely add it. You could add a, uh, if you had a back end that was a database, you could add a select count star from table with the where clause ranked. Um, that would definitely be one way to do it. Um, I think the, you know, we, we've, we support pagination using the standard GraphQL pagination, and, and that's one of the benefits to GraphQL is that now you, the clients can write you know, queries that page through sets of results, you know, lists of authors, lists of shopping items, et cetera, um, in a standard way, not caring that, oh, for this REST API, I need to provide a next cursor. For this one, I need to provide a limit offset. Um, and I did have a point there. I'm not sure if that standard provides a optional count of how many, what's the total number of records available, but that would be useful if it did, because then it would be a standard way of doing it. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say with the count one, Dan, I'll just, you know, put a little color commentary in there. You know, when we first put XML and JSON into the databases, they didn't support count very well either. And so these things do evolve over time. And um, some of that precedence also is what allows us to do batching uh, and to be able to get the information back and know from the results that we get back, which of the results go to how we populate our response based on what we're getting from the back end. So, so, so it's, it, it is a matter of, um, you know, it, it, if it becomes a, a need, it will, it will find its way. Right. So Debbie Jones asked, does it scale? Yeah. So steps and runs as a cloud service. So you deploy your schema, your SDL files to our service and you get a running GraphQL service within you know within minutes within seconds and that service auto scales we worry about all of that you just issue requests we handle them and this i think an answer said omg it scales like nothing out there yes it's auto scaling at the back end um it works wonderfully of course we're biased but it does work wonderfully <laughs> So I think Kellen put the Discord up there. Come join Discord. Ask us questions. We'd love to, to chat with you there. Yes, that would be great. Love the questions on Discord. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bobby. Is this where we do the after show chat? <laughs> <laughs>